Good morning. This is Jason Dean coming live at you again from Film Fanatic headquarters. Hope everyone's doing good. It is Thursday at 9.28. So, yeah. I am about to go on a vacation. The, uh, the school that I work for, I, I started working for the Montessori School last year which is literally five minutes away from my house. It's an amazing place. Uh, it's been, uh, I don't know, one of the coolest things that ha has happened to me in a long time. Uh, really, really thankful to be working there. Really cool people, great atmosphere. I've always loved working with kids. Uh, I have a long history with working with kids. I worked for a long time in the uh, school district. I worked with lots of kids when I worked at the Camden Teen Center. I was there for about 10 years. And kind of before that job, I had a lot of experience working through, uh, with working with kids through uh, teaching, just, you know, giving drum lessons and, and things like that. And that's kind of always been a thing I do, you know, on the side I was working for a while at Bay Chamber. I'm still technically an employee there, which is an amazing school, a music school. But now, more or less, I still teach privately. I work with like older people now, but I've always had a lot of experience working with kids. And in this past year, I got a, a part-time job working at the Montessori School. And it's been awesome. It's one of the things I, you know, I'm really thankful for and one of the real positive things that has, that's definitely happened happened in my life you know within the last year or so and the other thing that's really awesome about it is it's been really flexible uh for my uh other my other uh personality my other weird life that i attempt to live as a uh, a working uh musician and you know as a gigging musician i tend to make you know probably most of my income during the summer or at least it, it has been that way, luckily, for me, and, and then also through teaching. But it's seasonal, and it's a seasonal place, seasonal area that we live in, so it can be tough during winters and when things are kind of like off-season because it is vacation land. So, you know, you have to navigate through that as, you know, being, being a person in the arts or whatever. It's always tricky. It, you can make it work. There are people who do it, and then some people you have to kind of depending on the situation, you have to fall back on other things. But I've always really enjoyed working with kids. I, I really love teaching. I love, you know, the energy that that involves. I love being around youth. It feels like it keeps this old man young. Uh, I, you know, I, I love the essence of that. So, but we're about to go on break, February break, which is hard to believe. So I have like the next week off. Tomorrow is my first day of vacation. So, yeah, it's kind of nice. The, uh, you know, so expect there to be probably more videos coming your way because I'll have even that much more time. And again, one of the other, other things that's awesome about, that's been awesome about this job is that I have a lot more flexibility with things. So that's one of the reasons I'm, able to do more of these videos and other things that I that I want to do in my free time that you know I didn't have necessarily before the time to do that or it was always kind of like I have to really you know kind of focus my time on on the things I want to do because it was you know kind of a little bit more rigid but thankfully things have really opened up and I am able to you know try to put in the time uh, with projects and things that I'm doing, uh, you know, on, on my own, which I always try to make that those things the priority over everything else. And it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of love put into it. There's a lot of passion, but there's, you know, it also, there's a lot of things around it that aren't really, uh, that are tough, that are tough sometimes as far as you know, in order to to develop your skill set in a regarded area, it requires a lot of time, a lot of hours. 
so that that causes that person or causes me to have to be you know pretty isolated a lot of the times and to try to focus on things with my work that I try to do and I also you know have another side of my personality where I'm very social so I try to you know make up for that when I am very isolated trying to work on the projects that I do and but it's uh it's worth it and also some things always take a little bit of a second or a little bit of a back seat you know certain relationships in my life always kind of take a little bit of a back seat sometimes that's a thing to to kind of balance a little bit more because I don't want to you know be um so closed off but it's a balance and in the work and the stuff that I work on most of the time is you know that's that's always been my number one priority the other thing too that I love you know with with what I get to do is you know and and, and a lot of that I attribute to being around kids is the the youthful energy but then I always feel I'm always discovering other things that I need to that I want to work on or improve on as, as far as music so I'm I never feel I'm kind of restless that way I never feel like I ever get where I need to be and it's a cliche thing but it's you know you hear that saying of where it's not you know it's not your destination it's the path to that destination that's the most important thing and I I truly believe that I I have a very restless side to me I really uh, you know, I'm always kind of trying to push forward, but I'm always feel, feeling like there's this, I'm always in this like state of flux of where I kind of want to venture down this avenue and try to push things that that way a little bit more. And so there are, you know, that being said, there are certain things that I've done, you know, for what it is that I'm very, very proud of uh, and that I stand by and I'm confident behind. But also, a lot of those times and a lot of those things are always kind of fleeting. And I feel that's what drives me more and more. So I don't really ever get complacent. I don't really ever feel I've arrived or I don't need to probably put in that time to... uh, to practice or to work on this different facet I always feel I need to keep going and it just has to happen and so it's always an interesting kind of flux around that whole process but with my schedule and things now I'm able to kind of just be in that zone much more so I'm really grateful I try not to take things for granted because I realize there's a lot of other musician friends of mine who are not in that place, they don't have access to, say, a practice space. They don't have the, the luxury of having a schedule where they can, uh, you know, put the time in. Or they, you know, financially, it's the other thing, too, where they'll have to do some other full-time job, whatever that entails, that they're not necessarily happy with. And they really have to, you know, kind of really prioritize, prioritize their schedule. And it can be really tough and stressful. Thankfully, I don't have that, and I haven't. I've been very fortunate, knock on wood, not to not to have that schedule for a long time. There were many, many years where I, you know, I worked in restaurants for a very long time, and there were many, many years, you know, probably ten years, maybe more, of where I was in that I was in that space, and it was very, 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 very tough and legitimately hard to focus. You know, kind of. I'm kind of a lazy person in a lot of ways too, where I it takes me a while to get my juices going and to get motivated during the day. That's always been another factor. But back when I had those things of where I had limitations my with my schedule, it was it was generally always a struggle to make things happen, to make things work. I I tried to always find a way and I would, but always hard to try to like, you know, prioritize and find that time. So now that my life, thankfully, in no, in that regard, is much much better, uh, I have that time. So I try not to, uh, 
you know, try not to uh, realize, I try, I try to realize that I do have that time to do that and don't, and I try not to take it for granted. So with this vacation coming up, there'll be more time for other, you know, diving in to more of those kinds of things. But then doing these videos, there'll probably be more videos coming your way. I usually do one a day. So, but I want to thank everybody for their support. The, uh, it's been a great journey and, you know, pe with people subscribing to this page, I did an interview for the first time on a podcast, Matthew Littlefield's uh, podcast, which was really fun. It was the first time being a guest on the show. And we talked about, you know, music in the beginning, but then we also, the focus of the, of the show was pretty much about film and it was really fun. It was a real cool learning experience. Like, you know, it'd be great to do more of those things in the future. I've never done it before. It was a whole new adventure. Um, I like having new experiences around it and, and in general around different things. But, you know, I, one of the other experiences I had within the last couple of years that was very new was actually writing, uh, published reviews for Opera House Video. I had never done that before, dove into that. And that was an entirely new thing to learn and to try to understand and to try to figure out. And that was a lot of fun. That was a really cool like experience. And I did that for about a year and a half. So I'm always open to new experiences. Doing these interviews that I've been doing on this channel is a very new thing. I really enjoy that. I've been doing more of those kinds of segments. So those will be uh, definitely a thing uh, that will, you know, that I'll continually do for this channel. So look forward, you know, if you dig this stuff, look forward to, you know, more of those coming up. And so that's that's been a lot of fun. I love trying to, uh, you know, do some new projects and do new things. And I especially like to take myself a little bit out of my comfort zone all the time. I really, I think that's great. That's an integral part to just moving forward and to, you know, learning. So, so today's show is going to be about a movie that is really a movie that is incredibly near and dear to my heart. And it is, I think, one of my, it, well, it's easily one of my all-time favorite movies. And that is Apocalypse Now, directed by the legendary Francis Ford Coppola. This originally came out in 1979, and I have a really long history around this film. I have a lot of incredible memories around this film, particularly around getting the chance. This is this version here that I have on Blu-ray. This is also one of my most prized possessions that I have on Blu-ray. This version is the Redux. The original version of Apocalypse Now came out in 1979, starring Mar Marlon Brando, Martin Sheen, Robert Duvall, this is one of those movies that is talked about and has been talked about many, many times. You know, and it's one of those things for me raises questions of like, well, what else? What else can I add to the conversation? The one difference is, for me, is as I, I haven't really heard too many people, which is always strange to me. I haven't really heard too many people talk about this version, which is the Redux. This film, Apocalypse Now, was, like I said, it came out in 1979 originally, and then it was re-released in 2001 with a whole bunch of added scenes. This version is significantly longer than the original. Um, it is, by by every definition, epic. On you know, in every way, shape, and form. Shape and form. It uh, it runs about close to three hours. There's roughly about an at there's roughly an added forty five minutes or so to this to this to this version, and I was fortunate enough to see this in the theater, and it was. I've gotten a chance to see certain films that I've loved 
that I've always felt were classics and that mo- movies that really resonated with me. I've gotten to see some films in the theater and they've always and, and you know there there'll be memories I'll always have. <clears throat> some movies I remember seeing in the theater for the first well not for the first time but movies that I've always loved deeply that I've gotten to see in the film you know in I had a really nice theater in its original form on film you know with that really incredible experience of seeing it in the cinema um some movies that I've gotten a chance to see to see uh were was uh quite a few years ago I got to see John Carpenter's Halloween the the original I got to see that from 1970. I got to see that at the Strand in Rockland, Maine, which the Strand is an an amazing theater here in Rockland. Um, you know, beautiful theater, beautiful seating arrange, arrangements. The sound is just incredible. One of the best like sound systems for a theater that I've ever experienced that I, that I've ever experienced. And I got to see that on Halloween in the theater and it was all from the original print. And it was actually a, it was rest, remastered and restored. Um, it was all this restoration done to it, and it had a real limited release. I think when they released that, it was only in select cities, and one of the cities uh, in Maine, luckily, was was Rockland. And I saw it on the big screen for the first time, you know. And that was a movie too, like any of these movies I'm going to talk about. You know, getting a chance to see them in the theater were always movies for the most part that I had. You know, uh, I was I had seen like you know, for instance, Halloween. I you know seen it probably two thousand times or whatever before you know beforehand. But that was one of the most incredible experiences uh, as far as going to the movies. It really was. It was literally like again, Halloween for example. I know that film like the back of my hand I've you know that's just part of my you know DNA and seeing it on you know seeing it in that format seeing it in the theater all restored the original you know the original print from the you know actually seeing it in the film version and it was uh, actually even uh, there was an extent it was an extended version of the film so it was like I remember it was like 15 minutes longer there were some extra scenes it was one of the greatest uh, most magical experiences I ever, I've ever had in the theater. And it was, you know, again, it was one of those things where it felt like I was seeing it for the first time. It was all new and it was all fresh and it was all like, it, everything was so uh, vivid and every everything just was popping so so immensely at you, the, the sight and sound. And it was one of the greatest, one of the greatest experiences I ever had in the theater. Other movies that I remember seeing in the theater that I, where I was just totally like blown away, you know, by seeing it in the theater, you know, especially when it came to say classics, um, what I would well I'd have to say probably this movie here. This movie, Apocalypse Now Redux, was probably. The greatest, probably, I mean, I've had a lot of great experiences seeing movies in the theater. Um, but I have to say, probably Apocalypse Now Redux was probably the greatest experience I've ever had in the theater. And it's hard to say. Lots of memories. I remember going to see... One other really great experience. There was a really awesome horror movie that came out a few years back called "The Girl Who Walks Along," "The Girl Who Walks Al- Alone at Night," and it's just just an amazing vampire movie. I had I had bought it on Blu-ray and I had seen it. Totally fell in love with that movie, and then I got to see it in the theater, like maybe a month or so, and it was on. It was in film. It was on film. It was the original print. I got to see that also at the Strand. And I had seen it, you know, a few times before. And it was literally like that experience of, like, seeing it for the first time. It was, like, a a real uh, transcending experience. Just amazing. Uh, 
it was just amazing. Another movie I remember seeing, which was the original print, which is this old school horror film, Don't Look Now with Donald Sutherland, a really great supernatural horror film. I got to see that, and that's a classic 70s horror film. I got to see that in the theater. That was also at the Strand, and that was the original uh, print, the original film. And I had never seen that movie before, and that movie is just truly amazing, and I got to see that on the big screen. Uh, other experiences I remember having where I went into the theater, and they were just totally like transcending experiences. Was I remember, well, even when the first three Lord of the Rings movies came out, Lord of the Rings movies by Peter Jackson. Uh, when I saw those first three in the theater, initially that was, I was so blown away by by that experience. Just incredible. Um, and I remember going to, you know, a theater that's been closed for a very long time, but it was such an amazing place. I remember going to see um, movies uh, well, a movie by my one of my favorite directors and writers, Paul Schrader. He did this incredible movie with Nick Nolte and Willem Dafoe called uh, Affliction. I saw that at Bayview, Cinemas, uh, Bayview Street Cinema in Camden many, many years ago. And I saw that film in on, on actual film. And I saw that in the theater. And that was just a magical experience. I saw... Um, you know, just some incredible movies there. Uh, I remember going to see The Apostle that was directed by Robert Duvall. Just an intense movie and just such an amazing film. And I saw that in that theater. And that was just truly an incredible experience. I've seen some... So there's like, you know, five or ten... I'd say about, you know, maybe ten movies I remember seeing in my life over the years, over the span of a long time, that were truly, like mind-blowing experiences uh when i saw and as far as more recent movies going to see films like the arrival i saw that in in dreamland at the colonial theater one of, by denny villano one of my favorite directors seeing that in the in the theater was just you know just amazing amazing going into a pretty cold he hadn't you know it was my first time seeing it also even more recent than that would be Denny Villeneuve's 2049, the Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049, seeing that in the theater, that was a mind-blowing experience. I've, I've had some experiences where it was a little bit more intense than, you know, your normal kind of, you know, movie-going experience, which is usually always fun and great, but those experiences in particular were just uh, completely immersive and completely mind-blowing, especially around seeing Halloween on the big screen. But seeing Apocalypse Now, the Redux, the extended version on the th in the theater, was truly, you know, overall the the greatest movie going experience I've ever had. As far as going to an actual theater, being in that dark room with some friends or some strangers, the lights go down, the curtain opens up, and it is a, you know, the definition, the very the very definition of a true like ritualistic experience. And again, I went to see, there was, you know, like a limited release for this film. And I, this was a movie that just always blew me away. I always watched this. I, I had seen this film many, many times. I have about three or four different copies of this. I have a copy of it on, I have like three, three copies of it. I think, yeah, three, three or four copies of this film on dvd i have a bunch of different versions i have the the i have like two or three different th uh theatrical versions one that has was the original release the, the original theatrical release that is just kind of a standard dvd i have one also another version which is the original theatrical version version but it does come with, you know, special features and there are outtakes uh, that were eventually used in this film. There's commentary by Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, it's got a lot of, you know, good things. But this this version is truly the greatest version. 
I've always talked about that on this show that a lot of the times movies that I buy, you know, a lot of the times they come with, you know, two versions of, of, of that, of that film. You know, there's a one, one movie that I just recently talked about. Actually, I talked about it on this podcast. Uh, one of my all time favorite movies, one of my favorite slasher films of all time, of all time is My Bloody Valentine. There's a that's what I think a really good example of that where there's there's two versions on that Blu-ray. I have it on Blu-ray. I got this amazing, beautiful uh, DVD version or Blu-ray version of that film last year, and it has two versions. It has the theatrical cut, but then it also has the director's cut, where it does have uh, quite a few extended scenes. It's a little bit more gory, and that's my go-to. So typically, a lot of these films that have come out that I have bought have you you have access to to two or three different versions of the films and i usually always go and and this also is related to or pertains to uh for foreign films where you'll have you know for like say foreign films you'll have the original you know well an example for for foreign films would be one of my all-time favorite slasher horror exploitation movies that that I really uh really really love that I bought I bought last year and it's called Pieces just an amazing amazing movie that there's a a theatrical version and that's a Spanish film and then there's also the the original Spanish cut in the American version, you, there's a dubbed English version, which is still pretty good, but there are certain scenes that are different. And then it also, with the option with that Blu-ray, is it comes with the original Spanish version where you can wa- watch it in its you know native language. And there are scenes in that film that were cut that were cut from the American version. And so, in case you know, in the in the example of like foreign films. A lot of the times you have that option to watch it either in the English dubbed version or the the native language that the film was originally uh, had had was released in. And typically, a lot of those foreign versions didn't really see a lot of the the light of day. It was usually, at least here in the states, it, usually you the people who went to see these movies in in you know the the in the days of the grindhouse cinema. Or seeing it in drive-ins or drive-throughs, you only would see the American version, the dubbed version, which are still great, and there's there's still a real fun aspect to that. But watching the, if you have the ability to watch, say, like the original version in its respected language with subtitles, to me, it's so much better. You you get so much more of a grasp of what the story is you uh it's more cohesive a lot of the times sometimes things make a lot less sense uh as far as the narrative uh and and also that a lot sometimes there are scenes that are cut out so i typically always go for that when it comes to foreign films if i have that option i'll i'll watch the original uh native language uh version uh, I've been buying lots of foreign films, so that's been a thing I've been seeking out. And luckily, a lot of those Blu-rays have that um, that option. And when it comes to other films, like this is, I think, a primetime example of that. Movies like Apocalypse Now and there's a whole bunch of other movies. There are, you know, one, another great uh, example or examples are, say, the Alien, Ridley Scott the great Ridley Scott uh, classic Alien from 1979, and then also James Cameron's Aliens, the sequel. I have both of those on Blu-ray, and those are just two movies that I just love to death. I've done shows, and I've talked about those films extensively. I have both of those on, on really... I have both. Uh, di- I have two director's cuts of that on Blu-ray, and both of those come with the option of, you know, the theatrical release that came out, you know, in those years when that, when that film was released, but then it also has the option to watch the director's cut. And 
those both of those films have you know i believe like 79's uh or 1979 alien the 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 second movie directed by ridley scott in his career that has about 15 to 20 minutes extra footage uh for the director's cut and then for aliens it's about 20 25 minutes of extra of extra footage uh for the james cameron version and i notice so every time, and I notice when I watch those versions, the director's cuts, it they're they're superior to me than the theatrical releases. So I don't even really watch, and and the theatrical releases were the ones that the versions I saw obviously as a kid, or that I you know for Aliens, for instance, that was one of the first movies I ever saw in the theater, and it terrified the the bejesus out of me. And you know I'd seen it bazillions you know many many times after uh you know and i you know again one of those examples like i've seen that movie both of those films so many times i know them like the back of my hand but watching the director's cut it's so much better it's it's really fresh it's always uh to me it, it always gives me this feeling that i'm watching these classics for the first time and you just the whole narrative of the story changes and it's more interesting and it's less the there's you you get the sense too that there might have been pressure or there was pressure on those studios like say fox for instance around those two particular movies where there was pressure from the studio on the those directors to you know cut make these certain cuts to maybe shorten the length of the film or maybe have a little bit restraint but on these director's cuts there's they you know their their full vision is totally intact and you're seeing exactly what you know what they wanted to see as as you know the creators of these films on the big screen so i you know now i don't even watch it whenever i throw those movies in for example and there's many other examples of that for other films but now when i watch those films i never watch the theatrical version anymore i always watch the director's cuts because i've always found in my time they're always better you know the same thing even for the other ridley scott classic blade runner one of my all-time favorites there is a director's cut for that those are yeah they're they're superior and this is probably the best the best example of that this has like almost an hour of extra footage 45 minutes to an hour roughly the for this classic they cut out a lot of this uh, the from the original cut when this was released so seeing this on the big screen when they when it was announced that they were going to sh- that they were going to re-release this in the theater i i went i you know jumped at it and and it was truly the most transcending experience ever that i saw in the, in the film this movie is such um such a dark and har- and harrowing but yet meditative journey unlike anything i've ever seen um and the whole psychedelic element of this film and also the the slow burn pace the the the, the pacing of this film is at such a slow burn but yet there are, there are moments where there there's no dialogue there's not necessarily a lot going on but yet, visually and through the music and the way the whole aesthetics are around this film, you're just getting so much. And it really is, you know, within five minutes, this is one of those films, within five minutes, I am just in the palm of the hand of, of Francis Ford Coppola. Like, he can take me anywhere. And it's really that slow trickle, that slow burn atmosphere. And it's about that journey, you know. And this film is based on you know one of my favorite books of all time and it's kind of more uh, i kind of consider it more of a short story even though and that's robert conrad's the heart of darkness that's one of my all-time favorite books and that this movie is is based on that book it is quite a bit different in a lot of ways because this film is more centered on the idea or the social climate of obviously the vietnam war but there are so many, uh, you know, I remember reading Hearts of Darkness. I've read it quite a few times, and I remember reading 
that story and I love it to death and then watching Apocalypse Now right after and there are so many uh, similarities particularly around Colonel Kurtz who's played by Marlon Brando just you know one of the most enigmatic mysterious uh, and horrific characters ever created in literature and cinema there's so many interesting things and parallels of how similar uh, the narrative is from the original book to uh, to what Mar- Marlon Brando did with Colonel Kurtz compared to the Conrad's version of the of the book. And obviously, the difference is the the setting. It's a you know it's kind of a social uh, take or exploration of that time of living in war. And the the insanity around it, uh, particularly around the Vietnam War, and how complicated and how incredibly messy things were, and also how just how disorienting everything must have been during that time, or to be in that situation itself, and the The idea, too, of these characters being, particularly around Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen's character, where there's there's also this razor blade fine line between doing, or at least doing what you feel morally is, is just. And then it also raises those questions between, you know, what is really good and what is evil? Who is the hero? Who is the villain? And what is, is there a greater purpose behind any of these things that are, you know, transpiring as to, you know, the situation that we, that those characters are facing. And it just really, I feel like this film really portrays the, that gray area and that the darkness that, that's, you know, that particular social climate represented and what the, Essentially, you know, this these monsters were kind of created out of this particular social climate. And rules and regulations and any sense of morality eventually is just kind of thrown away. And the person or that individual becomes just kind of bankrupt in that situation because there is no more law. There is no more morality. It's all subjective, but then there's no sense of uh, a moral compass anymore or what is too far or what is uh, not enough. Uh, it, it raises all of those questions. And this is like, I've talked about it before where, you know, Francis Ford Coppola is one of my favorite directors and The Godfather, I did a big show on The Godfather a few months ago and that's like my favorite, uh, my favorite film of all time. Um, and you know that that is my go-to movie. But this is right up there too. I mean, it's so hard to say what your favorite movie is, your favorite director. But this is like right up there also. But this package in particular, uh, I bought this. I bought this a few years ago. I saw this version in the theater when it came out in 2001 and I saw it in the, in Dreamland in Belfast which is you know it's been closed for 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 quite a while hopefully something will happen we'll see it's such an amazing theater and I got this and I saw this there and it was like I said it was the greatest movie going experience ever and it, you know it's funny too because a lot of the times people complain about the length of movies because well this movie is pretty long it's like two and a half hours you know it's it's a it's a you know you got to put some time into it you know one other recent film that I did see in the theater that was pretty long close pretty much the same length was James uh, James Cameron's Avatar two that clocks in at a, in, a, in about uh, you know roughly about three hours or so. And I think it's actually longer than this film. But, you know, thankfully that movie didn't drag and it moved along pretty well. And But obviously with this, this is like a next level experience. 
but I sometimes hear that it's still it's still a thing where people will complain about films thinking that they're way too long, they're too bloated, but usually people complain a lot about the length of films. Saying that they're too long generally, they don't have the, the uh, attention span for it. And I never, I don't know, I never understand that. It's like, of course, nobody wants to sit down and watch a movie that you're that you're just bored to tears, you know, uh, you know, and you're and you're just, you know, and, and things are just dragging. Nobody wants that experience, obviously. Like, think there are things, there are movies out there that are just maybe too slow, and they're not exciting. They're not engaging. You're not getting those, you know, enough information to keep you going. It doesn't, even if it's a slow burn film. And obviously, nobody wants to, to sit through a boring film. But when it comes to actual length of a film, you know, I think movies like this uh, and other films, like I mentioned, Ridley Scott's Alien, like at face value, those films are incredibly slow. Like they're incredibly slow. But, you know, and there's whole scenes of where there's no dialogue. There's not really necessarily anything going on, but it's the atmosphere. And you're getting from those creators of those films, you're getting information through various ways that I feel is, you know, being the viewer, you're being slowly pulled in. And before you know it, you know, 20 minutes into it or 45 minutes into it or, or an hour into it, you're just totally in that zone. And you're like, you're on that, you're in that, you know, you're, you're on that, that journey. And wherever they take you as the filmmakers, you know, from the at least from the filmmaker's perspective, they'll, you know, once they feel they have you, then they'll take you anywhere. And and being the the viewer, the fan of those films, or that experience, I'll go anywhere. I'm I'm hooked. I care about everything. And to me, that is such a, a high level example of craftsmanship of where you can take so little but then still introduce these elements that are just enough that they can slowly pull you in and en engage with you in a, in a way and then before you know it you're like full on you know 10 percent or uh, well not 10 percent 100 percent you're you're in it and wherever that goes you have to see what's going to happen and i think you know and and less qualified hands you know when you know directors like as amazing as Ridley Scott or Francis Ford Coppola and, and, and direct, you know, other directors who are maybe not as skilled who try to do something ambitious like that. Obviously there's a, there's a big fundamental difference because they just don't have that, uh, that, I don't know, that magical way of telling a story. It, things could go askew or it could just be flat out flat out boring or it could you know they there there might not be that balance but i think those films and particularly this film has that where it really gives you just enough and then when things do happen on and also where there are big reveals it really is uh, a magical experience you know, and again, like I said about people complaining, and it's still a thing, people complain about lengths of, of movies a lot. And a lot of the times people say they don't want to go to the movies because they feel most movies these days are too way too long. And they don't want to sit there in the theater for two and a half hours. And it's it's boring. It's They, they want to be able to like get up, go to the bathroom, or make some food, or whatever, you know. And... But at the same time, I never, I never understand that, that attitude because I feel we live in an age now where, you know, people binge watch movies for hours, hours. You know, they'll pick their favorite TV show through their favorite streaming service, and they'll literally watch five or six hours of that TV show. Like that's a common occurrence for for what people do, and that's like a daily practice for people. And to me, that I find, like, I love a lot of television shows. I do. There are really, you know, there's a lot of great, you know, series. There's so many great series of television shows out there, especially now with, and now there's so many, so many options and choices that it's kind of insane. 
Um, but for me, I find that kind of thing, you know, overwhelming and 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 just too long. I'm my for my personal taste. Like there are certain series and of television shows that I really love. You know, my favorite being the first season of True Detective. I'm going to be doing a show on that pretty soon. That's my favorite show. Another show that I really loved was um, Manhunt, uh, the story of Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Those things are different because they play out for me like, like films. They're essentially like five or six hours long. One season and then you're done. There's the conclusion. There's no silly, ridiculous cliffhanger <laughs> at the end of it. And that series or show does not go on for 10 years that being said there are some shows out there that are really really great like high quality television shows but generally for me when there's a series out there that exceeds more than one season and and then you're talking where you're going into territory of where now there's like three or four seasons or more which is kind of the average now now there's like at least most most tv shows that are out there are at least you know four to five seasons and that's a lot of time and that's a lot of work I feel to sit through and after I've had that experience where I have watched certain series certain television shows that I thought were really good but and then I'll make it through a season and then I'll get through this and then I'll get the second season and I'll watch that and I'm enjoying it but then like the third of you know I don't know maybe the fourth or fifth hour of that series and again this is just my own take or preference on things after i watch a series and it's like you know coming to the fourth or fifth hour mark uh fatigue sets in for me i start getting exhausted and it, and it happens to me even for um first seasons because those tend to be long a lot of the times but it happens a lot, you know, around that time. Even if I'm totally engaged with the show, I, I think it's great. One example for me where that happened was one of my favorite actors is Idris Elba. He did a, an amazing cop police show, it's super dark and really gritty, but this really great show called Luther. I love that show to death, but I can't bring myself to finish the whole season or to finish the whole series because it's there's like, I think there's five or six seasons of it. And I've watched like maybe two or three seasons of it. And I think I was starting to watch the third season. And as much as I liked it, I thought it was really great. I mean, everything around it is so good. I just felt this like fatigue set in where I was just like, I was burnt out. And I'm like, okay, I just want this thing to be wrapped up. I just want it. I just want the conclusion of, you know, how this story is going to end. This is just going on. I just feel like it goes on for too long. And then it just, un it, overstays its welcome for me and then i'm just tired and then i'm just like okay i want to i want to throw in a two-hour movie and be done you know that's why i love film that's one of the reasons i love film so much over television shows is because you know you're getting something you're going into that space you're going for that journey and then you're done and then you move on to the next thing but it's like cohesive it's you know it doesn't take up 90 hours of you know of your day or your night and it's conclusive it doesn't go on and on and on and on and on and so i couldn't watch that show anymore i stopped watching it and i just got sick of it and i you know it's good as it is and i think it's a fantastic show i was just like i can't do it anymore but but that practice for people is like a daily occurrence so i never understand people saying well you know apocalypse now it's like three or four hours and i'm like what like I see and I hear people talk about, yeah, I watched this blah, blah, blah TV show for like nine hours straight. And I'm just like, what? Like, who has that time in their day to do that? Who wants to do that? Like, that's cool. And I can I can watch a few movies back to back, you know, and, and totally do that. And I get that. And I love that. But, you know, that's a different thing. But anyway... This Blu-ray version of Apocalypse Redux is, this might be, I have, I have some Blu-rays in my collection that, and even, even a few DVDs that I have that are actually really great editions of those particular movies that I really, really love. But this, and, 
and I, I, you know, I have some really fantastic Blu-rays that I'm really happy that I have and that I, I'm proud I own. And that were, some of them were not cheap, but I'm glad I spent that extra buck on them. But I, I don't know. It's and it's hard to say, but I kind of feel like this might be my favorite uh, film in my entire collection as far as Blu-ray releases. This is just incredible. There's like nine hours of special features on this package. Like it's insane. There's interviews. There's extensive interviews with with Martin Sheen uh, in this film. There's interviews with him, and there's extensive interviews with Francis Ford Coppola. And John Milas, who was one of the writers. Uh, there's so much detail in this. And the documentaries and the interview segments on this on this disc are just unbelievable. Out of this world. So interesting. This was also the movie that got me into The Doors. The Doors is one of my... They're one of my favorite, like, quote-unquote, classic rock bands. And I've always loved their music. I've always thought it was really dark. Had this edge. It was very mysterious. And as a kid watching, I saw Apocalypse Now, the original cut. I probably saw it like probably the first time when I was in high school. And it just blew me away and just kind of devastated me. Uh, but it was the first time I heard The Doors. And that really piqued my interest as to what is this like dark and spooky music that's, that's involved with this music, uh, that's involved with this incredible movie. And since then, I... This movie made me into a huge Doors fan. And this movie also reintroduced the public to the Doors. It like literally kicks re you know, it, it reignited the public's interest in the Doors. Uh and I think it's one of the greatest examples of perfect symmetry between sight and sound. The music uh is just absolutely incredible. Just absolutely incredible. They go into such detail of how they how all of those things were technically done. And they go in such detail with all of the hardships that were involved um, in making this film. It was such a brutal and uh, horrific journey for a lot of these people involved with this film. And they, they endured so many hardships to make this film, particularly Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Sheen having a heart attack. Um, and... And then they go on and make this, you know, thing of like pure art and pure beauty. Uh, but this, because of the packaging, I mean, the packaging is just incredible. The whole remastering comes with two discs. I mean, and the, the special features. Uh, watching this on Blu-ray is just unbelievable. It, the The remastering of this film is just completely spectacular. Um and overall, I have to say that this is my most prized possession in my in my collection. Just the the amount. This was like thirty bucks, I think, when I bought it. I bought it a few years ago, and but the amount of extra things that you get on this disc is is just mind blowing, and it's so worth it. It's so it was so worth every penny. Um, I just yeah. And if you've never seen. Well, if you have to, I, I hope people out there have, have you know, you've all seen at least the theatrical version of Apocalypse Now because it's just a, one of the greatest American movies ever made. But I highly recommend if you haven't seen the Redux, the extended version, it really is next level. Like it really has this whole added scenes, particularly around the plant, the French plantation um, scene. It is magical and so incredibly psychedelic and then and this whole film is so incredibly psychedelic and trippy um just amazing and marlon brando being you know one of the greatest actors ever probably you know pound for pound or overall the greatest american actor ever so many great roles that i loved love him in and i loved him in godfather for instance but i i kind of feel his role as colonel kurtz is probably my favorite i mean he is so terrifying but yet so vulnerable so uh so has such a quality of where you have empathy t about him or towards him but then you're so disgusted and repulsed by him at the same time and uh you were and then you have like sympathy towards his character and then at one point you're 
you almost feel like you're kind of on his side, but then you're like repulsed by him. And he's really vulnerable and he's like, you can get the sense that he's like, uh, you know, he's very scared and kind of this weak guy, but then he's also just such a monstrous person, uh, you know, capable of doing some of the most heinous acts that you'll ever see. Such a complex character. But I, for my money, this is the greatest role Marlon Brando's ever done. I mean, it's just, it's, I don't know, it's it's the work of gods uh, on all fronts, I think, as far as acting and the direction, everything that makes a film a classic. I mean, it's as it's as high brow and as high level as as you can possibly be in 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 cinema. So this is Jason Dean. Uh, thanks again. This is a, a movie I've been wanting to do and talk about for a long time. Uh, my, my my most prized possession in my collection, Apocalypse Now Redux version on Blu-ray insane truly a magical experience so thanks again to everyone supporting this channel and uh we will see you next time peace